Hello and welcome to episode 17 of the U3A radio podcast. I'm Nick Bailey, and with the Queen celebrating her Platinum Jubilee this year, we thought we'd go behind the scenes and find out what it was like to be a maid at Buckingham Palace. The first question she asked me was, was I good at housework? Well, I sort of told a great big fib and said, yes, I was. We'll hear about a pageant pie competition taking place in the Midlands. And as the U3A also has a special anniversary in 2022, with it being our 40th birthday, we'll be talking to one of the organisation's co-founders, Eric Midwinter. There was a mass of people, about 12 or 13 million, about a fifth of the population, who were post-work and post-child-rearing responsibilities. And there was a sense that there was a terrible waste. For many years now, Photography has been one of the most popular pastimes of U3A members. It's certainly been a passion for Peter Reid, who's been the National U3A Subject Advisor for Photography for almost 20 years. Peter, who lives in Salisbury and is a member of the appropriately named Spire U3A, told Ella Watts the most important thing he learned when starting out. Getting the exposure right was my problem originally because we didn't have exposure meters for instance, in those days, you had to do it with a little plastic dial. You dialed up the clouds and the time of year and the latitude and things like that. So it was all a bit guessworky in the past. What was your first camera then? Uh, well, a box camera. Wow. Um, by my grandparents, well, you just clicked. You didn't have any cho- choice. You just had to. <laughs> but later on, I had uh, I migrated up to an Agfa Silette, which was a film camera, of course. But it was actually quite good. I got to know that very well, inside out, knew how to work it properly. And that came about because of a a physics teacher at school. He uh, wanted some photographs taken for slides for projecting. And they had this film that would only have black and white on it. And it was ideal for copying things. And he had this had this 35 mil camera and he had nothing on the backing of the film, which amazed me at the time, I remember. (laughs) So how old were you at this time? Well, that's about 15, I suppose. Is that sort of roughly when you started? No, no not seriously. I started seriously in 1987, if you like, and that was my wife's fault. She was uh, very instrumental in pushing me to do things. She, well, I, uh, she um, found a course at Great Missenden at Abbey. It was a black and white, no, first of all, she did colour. She processed colour film. I was about amazed that she could do that. <laughs> and... Uh, then she, she went on to this black and white photographic course, and I thought, well, that's all I to have a go at that. I knew I had an enlarger in the loft because I'd done that in the past. So we got together, Sheila and I, and um, we progressed through this course for two years. Then we moved from Beaconsfield, where we were, to Salisbury, where we bought this shop, and um, I had a studio on the top floor. And I, I was taking photographs of people's embroideries and so forth, tapestries, canvases, things in cathedrals. The, the Salisbury Cathedral, for instance, I photographed the main altar frontal there, but also in other places like St Albans, Bath Abbey and so on. So I did quite a few. Uh, oh, Wells was the main one I did. They, they had the Millennium Project they had there. They had two altars in Wells Cathedral and they had five altar frontals and all the dressings and so forth for that. Uh, but I belonged to two camera clubs at the same time. Well, both, both of us did. And one of the things from the black and white course was that we then used that information to, to go around clubs to teach them how to do things. And we used to take uh, dishes, photographic dishes with uh, developer and chemicals and things in there. We used to have long, long trestle tables all the way along their, their hallway. And we used to dip things in and colour them and all sorts of things. That was good fun, that was, in the old days. So what did you think when you suddenly found that digital was the thing? Well, I didn't think much of it, to be honest. (laughs) The film stuff in my head is still good. I think the dark room was lovely to work in. Sheila and I, together, we worked in the dark room. When we we used to run classes here, Sheila and I wrote one of the, uh, well, the only digital photographic uh, course for the U3A, which ran for several years. And it was a tough course for students. 
So when you go out to shoot yourself, do you take anything other than a camera and a lens? Do you have any specialist equipment? This is the thing you know must have, your brain, your eyes must be looking to see what's what, take in the whatever's required. See, if I'm taking people out to a site, I usually set them something to do. So it might be chimneys, for instance. Photograph chimneys, but photograph them in an unusual way, I try to get them to do, which is never easy. So getting unusual, unique pictures is always the aim, and sometimes they succeed. So out of all the photographs you've taken, which one's your favourite? Well, I've got a, a picture taken in Scotland of a set of five silver birch trees. I think it's a gorgeous little picture. Um, another good one was one of hosta leaves, dead hosta leaves. Uh, in the autumn, they go beautiful colours and so on. And um, if you take them in the right manner, you can get a really gorgeous picture out of it. So you like nature, really? Yes, I do. But I, do, I take everything. I don't care, really. <laughs> Portraits, I do. Things like that. Insides. Of, I take people pictures, street photographs, you know, all that sort of thing. Yes, there's quite a lot of things going on in the world, and I, I don't like to miss them, nearly. <laughs> Peter Reed, the U3A subject advisor for photography and one of the judges of the U3AI, the monthly photography competition, which has a different theme every month. If you'd like to enter, the deadline is the last Thursday of each month. Just go to the National Learning Initiatives page at u3a.org.uk forward slash learn. In this, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee year, I thought it'd be interesting to speak to someone who had inside knowledge of Her Majesty's inner sanctum. That person is Yvonne Toms, a member of Lou and District U3A in Cornwall, who for three months in 1971 became a maid at Buckingham Palace. And Yvonne joins me now. Yvonne, welcome. Thank you, Nick. Hello. 71 for three months. How did you get the job? Well, I had been working in Port Perro um, in the village for a summer season, for three summer seasons. And um, I decided during the winter I would do something different. So I bought the Lady magazine. Now, in the Lady magazine at the back, there are a few pages with lots of vacancies for housemaids and nannies and chalet maids and such like. And I, I signed an, an, an advertisement for a vacancy for a housemaid at Buckingham Palace. No experience necessary, full training given, apply to the master of the household. And I thought this sounded quite interesting. And so I did apply to the master of the household. So take us through the interview process. So I got the train down there and um, was met at the, uh, the gates by um, a policeman. And he sent for a porter who took me into the tradesman's entrance in Buckingham Palace Road. And, um, and then he handed me over to a housemaid who took me to Miss Martin's suite of rooms. There I was shown to her a suite of rooms. I was shown into a little ante room where I could take my coat off and comb my hair and make myself respectable. Who was Miss Martin? Miss Martin was the chief housekeeper and she was a very pleasant lady. She was ex-naval, uh, a very matronly, but, but a charming lady, lady and we got on really well. She said she liked Yorkshire girls and knew the county of Yorkshire. And then she said... She knew Paul Perrow and loved Cornwall. And so I thought, well, I'm, I'm in with a chance here. You know, we're getting on famously. Uh, and then we had to start the interview. And I sat down in front of her desk. And um, the first question she asked me was, was I good at housework? Well, I sort of told a great big fib and said, yes, I was. And then she went on to explain sort of the sort of chores I would have to uh, perform and uh, contracts of employment and holidays and hours of working and that sort of thing. And then uh, um, the, the interview was over and I stood and shook hands with her across her desk. And she looked me up and down and said, of course, you realise you won't be able to wear your skirts quite so short. Because, of course, back in 1971, we were still wearing mini skirts. And I had chosen the very longest dress I had, which was kneeling. But that was a little bit short in her eyes. And so then I was seen off, off the premises and uh, I went through Green Park thinking, well, I've been to Buckingham Palace. I haven't seen anything very royal or very grand, but nevertheless, I'd been. And then a day or two later, and another letter came and um, it offered me the post of housemaid at Buckingham Palace. The salary was £577 per annum. 
rising to a maximum of £622 per annum. We had three weeks holiday entitlement and we worked for a three months probationary period where, where it gave us time for me to decide whether I wanted to stay or whether they decided I wasn't suitable for working in the royal household. And presumably you got accommodation. Yes, we lived in. Um, I lived on the floor, on a floor attached to Prince Charles's floor because I was I was assigned to a royal floor. There were royal floors and non-royal floors, good floors and bad floors. And uh, I was quite delighted when I was taken to Prince Charles's floor by my senior housemaid. And then I was shown all around our floor, our corridor, which had four bedrooms numbered one to four for four housemaids. And I was in room number four because I was the last to join that, that floor. And so we had our own kitchen uh, for the four of us. We had each had our own bedrooms. We had a, um, a bathroom with a shower and a bath. And we had a lovely sitting room, beautifully furnished and decorated um, just for ourselves. And at the end of the corridor, there were two large ornate glass doors. And when we opened these doors, there we were faced with uh, Prince Charles's corridor. And he had a very wide, deep piled red carpet. So, yeah, so that was the first day. Did you get to meet the royal family? Yeah, the only person I met was Prince Charles. He was in his apartment several times when I had to go in and, um, and do a spot of, of mopping up. Somebody had, had spilled a drink on his um, golden coloured Wilton carpet and I had to go in and do a quick job till a porter could be sent for. And I, I passed him in the corridor outside and, and said good morning to him. I was supposed to have curtsied and said good morning, Your Royal Highness, but I forgot that and just said good morning. But he was quite sweet about it. If I'd started in December when they, then when, when they wanted me to, I would have met the Queen at Christmas and had a, a, a gift and shook hands with her. But they don't tell you that before you go. And I didn't start till the January because I had some commitments. So, um, so I missed out on the Queen. But I saw people coming and going uh, from, my, from my bedroom window and my kitchen window. Andrew and Edward were just little boys running along the corridors with the corgis. And you only stayed three months, but why? I had been courting a young man in Porpera during the summer season and we were writing to, to each other from, from Buckingham Palace. And I decided I wasn't going to make a career of polishing taps and brushing footprints out of carpets. I had a lovely time and met some lovely people, but it wasn't going to be a career move. And so um, when I had my three monthly um, interview with the master of the household, I gave him my notice. He said my appointment was confirmed and they were very happy with me. But um, I decided that was the appropriate time to give my notice in. And so I gave my notice in and finished a few weeks later. When I came out of the interview, uh, Margaret, the young housemaid, said, do you realise you're on the travel list? And I said, no, you have to do your three months probation before you go on the travel list. And I was down to go to Windsor Castle. Well, it would have been really nice to have stayed long enough to have gone to all the houses and seen how how they operate there and, and what it's like on the inside. But I'd already given my notice in, so I didn't actually get to travel. I think one of the perks was that you could go to the royal box at the Royal Albert Hall, couldn't you? Yes. When the Queen and her family and friends weren't using the box, you could apply to the purser's office for tickets if you fancied going to see whatever was on. And I managed to go three times in all. It was, it was, quite, um, it was quite special. And, and the very best time was when I went to see um, an international folk festival with singers and dancers and musicians, and they all came on in turn and did their bit. And then at the end of the evening, they cleared the arena. The whole arena was full of this, of this wonderful colour because they all came back in their national costumes and they all turned to the royal box and they struck up the royal anthem. And my friends and I rose in the royal box and they all looked up at us and started to sing the anthem. And if they didn't know the words, they were just smiling at us. And I did just feel like giving them a little royal wave from the royal box. But I didn't dare. It was quite a special time, yes. And what happened to that young man you were writing to? Oh, I married him, yes. We've been married for 49 years. The royal station we worked to treat. Yvonne Toms, thank you very much. You're welcome. Do you have any royal memories? We'd particularly like to hear from you if you were at the Queen's coronation in 1953. 
or indeed any royal event where you might have witnessed a grand occasion or actually met the Queen, let us know by getting in touch. The email address is communications at u3a.org.uk. That's communications at u3a.org.uk. Many U3As around the country will be celebrating both the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and the U3A's 40th birthday at the same time in June. The Bingham U3A in the Midlands is even having a pageant pie competition. Peter Cliff spoke to the chair, John Lewis, and asked first about their plans for a picnic. It's going to be a picnic where people, uh, members of Bingham U3A, bring their, their own food and uh, drinks. That's going to be on the 2nd of June. We're expecting up to 100 people. It'll be held in a sports pavilion. It'll be a, a field next to the, the pavilion. There will be entertainment from a top quality local swing band playing numbers from uh, various eras. So there will be that. Uh, and also, we are going to be having a pageant pie bake-off competition. Uh, and then after that, we'll all collapse exhausted into our beds. So I'm, I'm intrigued about this, um, the pageant pie. So presumably people will bake their pies and bring them along and everyone will eat them. Uh, well, I don't know about eating them. I am not guaranteeing that anybody will get a piece of anybody's pie. But uh, there will be prizes. Obviously, the Bingham U3A is very inventive. The picnic in the park, the Thank you. pageant pie. What, what other things have, have you got lined up in Bingham? Well, we, we like to think that we are very active in the community as a whole and not just uh, as a sort of club for the over 55s. I, I've long uh, harboured the ambition uh, of having uh, regular U3A meetings or events or activities uh, where the content is delivered entirely by U3A members. And we're having one of those uh, when we'll be doing a show called Beating the Blues, which is all about the blues or melancholia, whatever it's been called over the ages and suffered by so many people and uh, how we deal with them uh, and there will be three uh, musical performances uh, and two uh, spoken word obviously there's a point to this uh, this meeting will be uh, recorded and made available to anybody appropriate who wants it so that's one thing we're doing and then looking much further ahead is our 22nd birthday party and we're planning another event for that the plans are embryonic at the moment bingham's obviously a, an exciting place to be for you 3a this just tell us where I'm, I'm sure people will now want to move to bingham so just tell us where bingham is roughly it's somewhere in england no it's in the midlands it's in nottinghamshire one of the most beautiful areas of mainland um, Britain. And has a very active U3A. It has. I would like to think so. Yes, Peter. <laughs> John Lewis, the chair of Bingham U3A. Now, although the U3A as an international organisation was founded in France in 1973, it wasn't until almost 10 years later in 1982 that it started in the UK. One of the co-founders, Eric Midwinter, is still going strong at the age of 90. And he'll be joining in the festivities at his local U3A in Harpenden, which is also celebrating its 40th birthday this year. He's been explaining to Joanne Watson what prompted the founding of the organisation in this country. I think the uh, changing mood amongst the progressive academics and, and others who were involved with older age were very concerned about the negative attitude, thinking of older people as over the hill, past it, can't do anything for themselves. And there was a shift towards a more positive ageing. I was director of the Centre for Policy and Ageing at the time, and my guiding principle was trying to be positive about older age. I think one of the very important things that always goes to be stressed is that Peter Laszlo, who was one of my 
two co-founders, had led the way in showing that we had moved to a society in which the majority of people were surviving to quite a later age. It wasn't longevity, it was survival. But it ended up with something of a, of a miracle, unknown in human history, whereby there was a mass of people, about 12 or 13 million, about a fifth of the population, who were post-work and post-child-rearing responsibilities. And there was a sense that there was a terrible waste of all that talent and experience that had been gathered together. And we saw the U3A as a way of both tapping that and bringing decent identity to the, the individuals themselves. Now, you use the term surviving, which is a, a rather depressing term, really, if you think about it. You were looking to do something to actually give people a purpose in their older age. Yes, yeah, it does have that ring, but it's more accurate than longevity. <laughs> There's no evidence that, that the species is living longer, but there is evidence that the huge majority of people are enjoying, shall we say, survival into a normal lifespan. What was the reaction, though, when you decided on this venture? There is a good deal of scepticism, and in fact, alarm in, in some cases. It also, uh, incidentally, went against the current grain of society at large, which had moved to a much more individualist view of, of uh, life, whereas we were suggesting a cooperative solution for older people joining together and running their own affairs. And it alarmed many professionals that we were embarking on that root way. There was certainly one friend of mine who was at one of the London universities at the time, as an academic, who was, who was helping with getting these things together, who got dragged before his trade union because there was a feeling in some quarters that, that if, if we did this, we would be robbing people of their jobs. But there was also a lot of medical opinion in, in those days that, that older people lost their marbles and couldn't learn which turned out to be rubbish. I mean, most of the research that had been done by the medics had, of course, been done on people who were ill. There was also the, the wrong-headed view that education was about preparing people for their life and for their occupations. So why did older people need education? They weren't going anywhere. So you had the opposition from the people who didn't think you should be doing it. What about the, the target audience? What was their reaction? Well, the target audience proved much more willing, although we, we had no idea with these sorts of projects, you, you go out on a limb and, and hope for the best. You know, as soon as we got it started, we got about 14 or 15 new three years going in the first few months. A critical aspect, we decided right away that we had to do two things. One was obviously we'd got to start new three years. But the other was to have a national umbrella, which enabled people to, you know, ring up and say, hey, what's this U3, can you help us, sort of thing. Peter Lazarus particularly had thought that once we launched the University of the Third Age, there would be 15, 20 other Third Age organisations which would leap into being, you know, let a thousand flowers grow kind of thing. And there wasn't one. And to some extent, that was because a lot of people just sat back and thought, oh, there's a U3A now, so that's settled that problem. In that first year, you know, I'd be going up and down the country and people would be asking me, why wasn't the U3A doing something about this, that and the other? As so, though, you know, we were the, the total solution to the older age. What we were always conscious of was that the U3A was, is, is, is not for everybody. It would be ludicrous to believe it might be. One of my epigrams, if that's not too ostentation a term for it, is to say the U3A is very good for those for whom the U3A is very good. Do you think that the self-help ethos is quite as prevalent today as it was when you started? I think that's a problem. If you're not careful, you end up by becoming a service charity and you have a few people delivering a service to a majority who come along, sit there, fall asleep, go home again, and, uh, and so on and so on. That is a grave issue. If you read the principles and, and all the rest of it, it's, it's quite 
firm that members contribute and are, are part of it and participate. And some will do it more than others, but you must never get to the point where it's just a, a few who are doing it, you know, and, and, a, and a many who are doing nothing. You might as well be the Red Cross or the St. John's Ambulance would be great then. Do you think, though, given that people are working much longer, that will have an impact on it? No, it shouldn't. Because although the, the working conditions change, and you've got to adapt to that, this is always simplifying it. It, it may be that the being 70 in, in 1980 was being 80 in 2020. What you three as, as a whole and individually should be doing is being more careful in their induction. They have made it something of a come along, will you know, do these things, it'll be marvelous, you don't have to bother too much. And I think the induction has got to say something along the lines well, we don't expect you to be running in, you know, the, the uh, zoological group on the day you start but you know and you feel like it and you know i got a bit more confidence got to know people who you'll be able to to fit in and do something along those lines it's the responsibility of the u3a each u3a to make sure that the groups are being run on a participatory basis and they haven't dropped into a didactic teacher student base eric midwinter one of the co-founders of the u3a in the uk and if you're a keen cricket enthusiast, you'll recognise his name as the author of many cricket books, including a biography on W.G. Grace, while Red Shirts and Roses, The Tale of Two Old Traffords, won the Cricket Society Book of the Year Award in 2005. Both he and the Queen have certainly had a very good innings, and long may they reign, but please not during a test match. A reminder before we go that we'd love to hear about your royal memories, in particular if you attended the Queen's coronation in 1953. Email communications at u3a.org.uk. And that email address again, it's communications at u3a.org.uk. And don't forget that apart from YouTube, the U3A radio podcast is now available on several podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple, and Google. My thanks as usual to Peter Clift, Joanne Watson, and Ella Watts for the interviews, and also to Ella for producing the podcast. Until next time, this is Nick Bailey saying goodbye.